I'm Tisha Bader, and in the news, a new report published this week by the Anti-Defamation League on anti-Semitism and radical anti-Israel bias in left-wing European politics, focusing on left-wing political organizations in France, Germany, Spain, and the United Kingdom. Well, to discuss this report further and to explain concerns about such anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism impacting similar groups here in the U.S., is the ADL's Senior Vice President of International Affairs, Marina Rosenberg. Marina joined the ADL just this year after 16 years in Israel's foreign ministry, leading diplomatic missions abroad, including in Germany and in the United Arab Emirates. She was Israel's first female ambassador to Chile in 2019. She joins us now from Washington, D.C. Marina, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you, Tisha, for having me. A pleasure. So before we get into the findings of this report, can you just give us some background as far as what led the ADL to look at this specific issue and in these specific four countries? Yes, of course. So as you know, ADL works not only within the U.S., but we look at anti-Semitism as a global threat. And therefore, we work together with our partners all over the world, but specifically in Europe and also Latin America. And we look with great concern as what, what is happening in Europe, because many of the trends related to anti-Semitism in Europe at the end arrive here to the U.S. So it's of concern to um, the American Jewish community what is happening outside the U.S. So we can all prepare to what might be coming here to the U.S., but also in order to show support, of course, to our partners in Jewish communities around the world. So what did you find looking at these four countries and their different experiences in this realm? What were some of the commonalities you saw and some of the differences? So um, in all four countries, anti-Semitism was used in anti-Israel and anti-Zionist uh, context. And we saw some uh, themes that repeated itself in the four countries. Some of them we also see here in the U.S., if it's related to Holocaust uh, trivialization, accusing Israel or Israel regime as being Nazi-like, um, accusations of Jews controlling if it's politics or economy um, or the media or even the art scene, as well as false charges regarding accusation of anti-Semitism. Uh, claiming that it's in bad faith and it's employed in order to avoid any criticism of, uh, of Israel. I want to just read a quote you say in the report. You say, while anti-Semitism from individuals associated with left-leaning political organizations is generally less violent than the threat of right-wing anti-Semitism, its increasing penetration into the political mainstream is deeply concerning. Can you talk about that a bit and how that sort of um, mainstream that mainstream uh, absorbs those kinds of thoughts and statements. Absolutely, it's very interesting because we worked with four different partners in these four countries that you mentioned uh, before, and they all mention the threat of uh, left wing antisemitism going mainstream in these four uh, countries. We saw it, for example, in the UK when it came to the Labour Party. We're not talking about some extreme radical left party. I mean, in the times of Corbyn, the Jewish community was really threatened by this phenomenon of anti-Semitism going mainstream in mainstream uh, politics. But we also see it today in Spain with the Podemos party that is part of the governmental uh, coalition. They have very not only anti-Israel, but anti-Zionist and even anti-Semitic uh, uh, trends and, and uh, uh, policies. And this is something that needs to concern us as well in, in the US, because this is a trend that might be coming um, here as well. But also the left-wing anti-Semitism is important despite the fact that it's less violent than far right-wing anti-Semitism, because it affects more Jews, mainly the young ones, also in campuses and universities around the world, not just in Europe and in the US. As you mentioned, I was in Chile and I saw that. And when we travel across the world and specifically in Europe and we meet 
with young Jews, they all raise this concern of what is happening from the left-wing uh, political circles. Interesting. So I just want to delve a little deeper into the possible impact here and what you're saying is already happening. Um, you also say in the report, there's no doubt that the anti-Zionist rhetoric and terminology popular in European left circles are increasingly being adopted and exploited by some in the U.S. political far left. Can we just hear some examples or get a better idea of what that looks like at the moment? Well, as you know, I'm new to the U.S., but the Jewish community here, unfortunately, see it almost on a weekly, if not daily basis. Uh, if it's in the social media with members of Congress um, uh, speaking out with anti-Semitic uh, tropes, not just specifically against uh, Israel, but against uh, Zionism in, uh, in general. Um, there were some activities also in, in Congress, uh, in, in uh, Senate uh, recently. So it's true that it's different from what we see in certain European countries, because it's still not um, completely mainstreamed, and it's more uh, radical uh, personalities. But it's something that we need to be aware and prepare for. Uh, so hopefully uh, we won't see this uh, theme as we see it in Europe. And it seems that sometimes the issue of Israel gets co-opted into other issues here in the U.S. that people are concerned about. And you spoke about young people especially sort of latch onto these ideas without having really any historical context or perhaps not having all the facts, but they're presented as part of a particular issue, even if they are completely unrelated. Absolutely. We see it in, in progressive uh, circles that claim to want to defend human rights uh, in general, but then specifically when it comes to Jews, Jews feel that they are excluded from those circles because they are seen as Zionist pro-Israelis and therefore they're seen as if they're on the wrong side of the, of the progressive map. And this is something that repeats itself also in the report concerning the, the European uh, countries. And another thing that we saw here in the US was um, how since May 20, uh, 2021, when uh, there was another clash between uh, Israel and, uh, and Hamas, we saw a peak in anti-Semitic uh, incidents and attitudes shown towards the American Jews, not just as a, a something that is shown only against the state of Israel. So the, the lines uh, are blurring between just being anti-Israeli and being anti-Zionist and therefore anti-Semitic. So Marina, how do you begin to tackle some of these issues and the realities that you're seeing from this study and from other similar studies? I, I can imagine it, it can feel quite overwhelming. What is the approach or how do you begin to approach it? Well, there are a few things that both Jewish communities around the world and we um, as ADL are doing and can uh, uh, do farther uh, into the future. So first of all, again, going to the UK example uh, of the Labour Party, sometimes it only takes uh, one political leader to make a difference, for, for better and for worse. In the case of Corbyn, it was uh, for worse, but then the new uh, leader of the Labour Party changed uh, changed the party completely where it comes to anti-Semitic tropes and made it unacceptable uh, for anti-Semites to be part of the party. On the other hand, we also need to collaborate globally Anti-Semitism is a global phenomenon, therefore we have to collaborate with partners, Jewish and non-Jewish partners around the world, and this is what ADL is doing. I'm sure you heard that um, a few weeks ago we launched the J7, which is the uh, task force to fight anti-Semitism of the biggest seven Jewish communities in the Western democratic uh, world, and we are working together with them to come up with policy uh, recommendations, with concrete actions to fight anti-Semitism, doesn't matter if it comes from the left side or the right side. Yes, and we actually had um, CEO Jonathan Greenblatt um, talk about the J7 just a few weeks ago, as you mentioned, and that we were sort of saying, you know, there's sort of a 
two sides of, of the coin, if you will, because one is it's it's scary and it's terrible that this is something that has to have such a global united front to deal with it. But the other side is that it can almost be something that is seen in a positive light as far as coming together as Jews in the world um, from Europe, from Latin America, South America, you know, the Gulf region, Israel, reminding ourselves that we are one people and this struggle is a common one. And if we come together, we're stronger. Absolutely. Absolutely. We need to shine together in order to uh, fight the negative parts of, uh, of our society. So tell us a bit about your role as in this new role. You just joined the ADL recently. And um, so welcome, first of all, into the U.S. as well. So and I'll just tell people you were born in Argentina. You moved to Israel um, at a young age. You made Aliyah with your family. And now you're here in the U.S. And you've as I mentioned, served in diplomatic missions around the world. You have incredible experience um, that you've seen over the years. Tell us a bit about this role as Senior Vice President of International Affairs. What does that entail? And just if you can give us a sense of what your day-to-day looks like. I'm still trying to figure it out, but but I'll try to answer your uh, your question. So, as an Israeli diplomat, you can imagine that I had to uh, uh, deal with BDS and anti-Semitism almost in every country that I served, and also from uh, Jerusalem. And joining the ADL gave me the opportunity to do it on a mar- much larger uh, scope dealing with anti-Semitism and fighting it all over the globe, which is a huge mission, of course. We have an international team. Uh, some are based in the US, others in Europe, others in uh, Israel, and others in, in Latin America. And we work together with the Jewish communities in those countries and those regions in order to help them uh, if it's through education, advocacy, policy uh, recommendations, and of course, research to deal with the phenomena of anti-Semitism. Now, it's true that each country is different, but there is so many um, things that they are, we have in common, unfortunately, when it comes to fighting uh, anti-Semitism. Now, I want to also ask you about this um index, this anti-Semitism index that came out for 2023, which again focuses um, a lot on Europe and sort of distinguishes between the anti-Semitism you found in Western Europe as opposed to Eastern Europe, where it was more prevalent. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So first, just to explain for for those that haven't heard of of it. So we do, it's called the Global 100 um, Index. ADL started doing it in 2014. Next year we will celebrate it. We will celebrate 10 years uh, anniversary. Originally we did a survey of 102 countries, and since 2014, every few years we do small surveys per regions. Um, this year we did of 10 European countries, including the four that we mentioned uh, before that are included in the left wing uh, report as well, and we found that. Despite the fact that in the Western European countries, uh, there is a small decline in the index of anti-Semitic attitude, still anti-Semitic attitudes uh, prevail in in Europe, Western and uh, Eastern. And we check tropes like um, sentences, for example, as Jews care only about themselves or Jews control the economy or uh, Jews Uh, care more about Israel than they care about their own uh, country. And all in all, we saw that a quarter of uh, Europeans in those countries that were part of uh, this year's uh, survey believe in anti-Semitic tropes. So this means that they believe in six or more tropes that were presented to them. And this is something, uh, obviously, that worries not just ADL, but the Jewish communities in those uh, countries. It was interesting to see that there was a a decline in Eastern European countries, but still that anti-Semitic attitudes are higher in Eastern European countries than in Western European countries. Interesting. And I I think that Poland was one of the countries that had 
um, a higher degree um, in that regard. And I'm assuming that some of that is has to do with the Holocaust as far as, um, you know, Israel and Poland have had these um, conversations back and forth as far as educating about Poland's role in the Holocaust, um, that there were Poles who collaborated with the Nazis, obviously not all of the Poles, but there were Poles that collaborated and Poland being very upset with these kinds of statements. Is there a connection, I would imagine, between Holocaust era um, issues and attitudes that are seen now in Poland specifically? Well, yes and no, because actually Hungary had even worse uh, index scores. And if we compare Hungary to Poland, so we can see some similarities where it comes to today's uh, right wing uh, regimes as well. So it has to do a lot with history and how the perception of especially the Polish governments in the past uh, years have changed. Uh, claiming that they are just as victims as the Jews and taking um, not not taking responsibility for the Pol for Poland's part in the Shoah uh, in the Holocaust, but it has to do more, I think, with current uh, political situation in those countries. And just to mention uh, some of the the data, so we said that one in four Europeans uh, uh, hold uh, anti-Semitic uh, tropes, but in Hungary, it's 37%, and in Poland, it's 35%. And that's a huge difference with the uh, 10% uh, in the UK, for example. Sure, and one in four believing six anti-Semitic tropes, you said that's really concerning, and that's a lot of people holding on to some very disturbing ideas. Absolutely. I mean, when we talk, for example, about Spain, so Spain has the worst index uh, score in the Western uh, European countries that we checked with 26%, but those 26% are 10 million people. So these are huge numbers of European residents and, and citizens that still hold anti-Semitic tropes. And when we check that it should be six or more, of, or more, it's because we we don't want just to uh, count people that believe in uh, one trope, like the Jews control the economy. We really wanted to see that these people in general have anti-Semitic uh, attitudes towards the Jews. What is it about Spain uh, that perhaps contributes, or do you have any more information as far as why those numbers are so high there? So Spain is a very interesting case because for decades, uh, the anti-Semitism there was more right-wing uh, type of uh, old-fashioned uh, traditional uh, anti-Semitism. And in the past years, the main threat as per the local Jewish community comes more from a left-wing a type of anti-Semitism as we show in our current uh, report. And in Spain, I think, and I just have been there uh, two months ago meeting with the Jewish uh, community as well as with the Jewish uh, students uh, and some NGOs. And, and there it's probably a combination of the history, of course, uh, the fact that there's for many years, decades, there weren't any Jews in Spain. Uh, there proximity to Jews and, and personal contact with Jews is very uh, low. And this is one of the contribution of higher uh, score numbers um, in, in our view, but it's also the political changes of the past years. Interesting. I wanna ask you one more thing, Marina, because I saw in your bio also, which is extensive and in, so impressive, uh, mm -hmm. that you also co-founded a group to um, advocate for equity for women in the mm -hmm. diplomatic sphere. And I'm wondering if you're still involved with that and just to talk about that um, with all your experience as a diplomat. Of course, but but we need a, a whole show for that. Uh, <laughs> I knew you were gonna say that. I <laughs> knew you were gonna say that. <laughs> it's my favorite topic. Oh, well, um, wonderful. We'll have to have <laughs> you back, but just give us a little bit. Yeah, of course. So, um, you know, in, in idea, we just had last week a full day of DEI learning. And, and I gave some opening remarks and I, I was very honest in saying, you know, for many years since I 
was born and grew up, I never took the gender issue or equality or diversity issue, issue as something that is related to me until I became a diplomat and joined the Israeli Foreign Service uh, and basically joined a world that was historically men dominated. Uh, and despite the fact that, of course, we made all of us together, men and women, uh, a, a lot of progress in that uh, realm. And today there are so many women uh, ambassadors. But the fact that in 2019, I was still the first and only until now female Israeli ambassador in Chile. This was something that wasn't uh, uh, of pride for me. It was quite a disappointed it's disappointment that we didn't uh, have a female ambassador there before, uh, same as in Washington, uh, for example. Israel until today never sent uh, a woman in the past uh, uh, decades. Um, and it's something that we need to change. And in order to change it, we need to take action. So one of the actions that I took together with some great friends and colleagues in the foreign ministry at the time was to form this uh, forum for women in diplomacy. So we created a network, not only uh, between Israeli uh, female diplomats, but foreign diplomats that served in Israel. Interestingly enough, since then, since 2012, this model was copied by other uh, colleagues in foreign ministries around the world, including in, in uh, countries in, in Europe and, uh, and in Latin America. And today I continue not as a diplomat, but as a feminist, of course, uh, to, to promote uh, equality and not just gender equity, but in general, uh, diversity and inclusion. I think it, it turns us into better society. Well, Marina, first and foremost, welcome to the U.S., to the Anti-Defamation League. You bring so much to this position, which is so vitally important for the American Jewish community and for the Jewish world. So we thank you for everything you're doing and will continue to do with the ADL. And thank you so much for being here on JBS. Thank you, Tisha. I really appreciate it. Marina Rosenberg is the ADL's Senior Vice President of International Affairs, and we thank her so much. Thank you, as always, as well to our director, Sloan Copeland, to our transmissions manager, John McDevitt, technical manager, Michael Paley, and producer, Carol Lilienthal. And thank you for watching In the News. <laughs>